if you could turn in the Word of God this morning to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Over the past few weeks, we've been going through this psalm, giving consideration to it. It's been a means of blessing to us. We thank the Lord for that. We trust it will be the same again this morning. Brother Paul Schlimgen uh, wanted me to pass on to you his appreciation for your prayers. Continue to pray for him and uh, pray that God will give him strength. He's in rehab. He's doing exercises. They're trying to get him back to a measure of strength that will allow him to return home. So continue to pray. God is answering prayer given just how low he was at one point. We're thankful for God answering prayer and we continue to pray for him. I think it's the Reverend Owen's birthday today, so maybe it's appropriate for me to say, is it not? Is it? It is. <laughs> Happy birthday to you, brother. Glad you're here. Trust the Lord will bless you with many more. Psalm 51 is where we are, beloved. So we're going to read the Scriptures, take the time to read all of this psalm. We want to become familiar with it. Someone said that some years ago, this psalm was part of the memory work in this church. And so it was committed to memory, though it fades so quickly. Such is the condition of our minds. But may we become familiar with it even as we read over it these weeks. Psalm 51, to the chief musician, a psalm of David, that Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation. My tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Amen. Let's pray. Our God, we cry to Thee to make us to feel what the hymn writer felt, that lament, a sense of, can there be mercy for me? We pray that in the despair of sin, the understanding of our coming short, that we would have our eyes lifted 
away from ourselves and to the cross to behold the Lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. If there be a heart here this morning that is far from God, perhaps someone who doesn't even know whether or not they are saved, O oh God, Thou knowest the condition of every soul. Thou knowest that older person who's struggling, battling, fearing. The young person who's filled with anxiety, concern, a rebellious spirit that dominates the heart, a battle with unbelief within the soul. Oh, wind of God, blessed spirit, fall on us. Let there be that word in season, that word that is appropriate, that word from God that we all leave here knowing that God has spoken to me. Give us ears to hear and fill this preacher then with the Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For those who are joining with us this morning for maybe the first time since we commenced this series, we have been, as I've said already, going through Psalm 51, a psalm that I have uh, tried to underline its importance, how significant it is in relation to helping us understand how we get ourselves back to God or how we come to God in a position of feeling the weight of our sin. The most important thing as a man, a woman, a boy, or girl can do is understand how do I be reconciled to God? How do I come to God? How can I be acceptable before God? How do I have my sins forgiven before God? How do I know? How do I come to a sense of assurance that the problem of my sin has been rightly dealt with? That I no longer need to feel the burden, the weight, the guilt, the shame, and the suffering that necessarily comes with that understanding of being cut off from your Maker, knowing that you have grieved Him by breaking His law, and there's no sense in which you uh, have any confidence within your own works. You're left without anything to rest upon, and, and you realize, I, I must have I must have this sense of reconciliation. I must be brought near to God. How do I do that? And Psalm 51 is perhaps one of the best portions that instructs us in being reconciled to God. And this is, this, the importance of this is further underlined when we realize that none of us can get through life without grieving God. You may not have ever sensed your grief. You've maybe never been in a condition of repentance or having been aware of your sin in a very real sense because you're not a Christian this morning. You've never been born again. You don't know what it is to be saved and to know your sins are forgiven, and to have that peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But for every Christian, we, we have all, at the time of our salvation, to greater or lesser degrees, we know what it is to be aware that we're sinners. We become cognizant of that. Even as children, we, we, we come, those children who are saved in, in their early years, they, they have some awareness that they have broken the law of God and they are turning to Jesus Christ to save them. As we age, of course, sin expands, extends, deepens, becomes more frequent, and therefore when we come to Christ later in life, perhaps then our, our repentance becomes even more profound and felt within our hearts. But as we go through life as Christians, as we go through the pilgrim experience as a believer, we come back over and over again to this experience that we have walked away from our God, we have turned our back on our Savior, we have traversed for a period of time, whatever length of time it may be, where we have not stayed in touch with our God. And that broken fellowship, that severed communion, that sense that, that there's something amiss is brought back. The, the restoration comes by following a similar pattern as we have here in Psalm 51. So, in a matter of weeks, we will perhaps say goodbye to Psalm 51. We will move on to something else. 
But I want to underline to everyone here this morning that when you are ever in a place where you know that you're away from God and you're wondering, how, how do I get back? You open up. Make it your first port of call. Open up Psalm 51 and you open up the pages of Scripture and you just read over it, meditate. I'm not talking about reading it like you do your normal daily reading. I'm talking about just keep pouring over it and praying over it until you feel the language to be your language. To When you read this, it's not just reading what David said, but this, these words become your words. And you're not just expressing as you read the Scriptures, here's David saying, have mercy upon me, O God, but you're feeling that within your own soul. You pray over it. You lament over it. You, you sob over it until it is imbibed and becomes the cry of your own heart. And some of the reflections that we have referred to by other men have pointed out that it is perhaps a psalm that is deep in places to really expound, but it is a psalm that can be more easily felt, can be understood by the feeling of it, by what it's like to be in a position of shame and guilt and just cry. The opening verses, as we have seen, are largely the, the lament over the sin, the confession of that sin. And then when you come to verse 8 particularly, there is this, what we've titled, the cry of recovery, the cry for recovery. And David expresses then in various ways this, this desire for recovery. He doesn't just want his sins to be forgiven, he wants to be recovered. He wants to get back where this man of God once was. And you think of the crime. You think of the extent of the sin. We've considered at times, this: can it be possible that someone guilty of what David was guilty of, can he know a full recovery? Can he? And David's language is encouraging because it expresses a sense of confidence that that can be the case there may be the experience of a full recovery. So we have considered his cry, repair my ears, essentially, when he says in verse 8, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. He wants his ears repaired. He wants to be able to hear joy and gladness. The prophet Nathan had said that God had put away his sin, but he hadn't felt a sense of forgiveness. The joy, the song of pardon had not entered into his own heart. And so he's crying to God, make me to hear that joy and gladness. Make me to truly hear the pardon. You know what that's like. You know what it's like to intellectually know that you're forgiven. To have sinned, confess your sin, and yet in another sense not feel that you're pardoned. And perhaps God has made it that way. In part, it can be unbelief, and no doubt in many cases it may be nothing but unbelief in the heart. But at other times, at other times, it is God withdrawing that ability to hear the pardon, to further deepen the grief over our sin, and giving more time to us to lament and consider what we have done before God so that it impresses upon our heart that we never want to traverse this way again. And so David hasn't really heard the joy. The prophet said, you're, you're forgiven, essentially. God has put away your sin as soon as David acknowledged it, but he has not heard it. He has not really heard the joy, the gladness of pardon. But he wants to. And this is part of the recovery. Repair my ears. Last week we considered, then verse 9, remove my sin. Remove my sin, hide thy face from my sins, blot out all mine iniquities. Very similar to language that we have already seen in the opening part of the psalm. But we considered a number of things last week that I trust were helpful. And we come then to verse 10 this morning. Renew my spirit, renew my spirit. So let's read verse 10. 
Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. David again turns to the inner part of his being. He has done this already in verse 6. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. He has he meditated on the, the inner part of the being, that this is not about pleasing, satisfying the community. It's not about putting on a show that everyone can see, oh, look, David's repented, and, and we accept him and, and recognize that repentance. It's not about the externals. The sincerity of heart requires a work within. And he has considered that God desires this. He desires truth in the inward parts. And later on, he's going to get back to it when he considers verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. This is the inner man. This is the inner being. This is the broken humility that comes by a genuine spirit-wrought repentance. This is not simply, I'm sorry for what I did. This is grief, sorrow. This is a man who's broken. This is a man who's crying out, longing that God would hear him and accept the inner brokenness of his own being. So verse 10 really is turning inward again. Create in me a clean heart, O God. I mean, you're right spirit within me. Heart and spirit refer to the inward part of the man. The first step of apostasy begins in the heart. And it was so for David. It didn't begin with his eyes beholding Bathsheba. It began, beloved, in the heart. There was something going on in his heart before that. It always begins in the heart. This is, this, this is where the preacher, the parent, anyone who's ministering to people, ministers in faith. I have no idea what's going on in your heart. None. I have no clue. God has not given. As part of the gifts, part of the gifts that he gives to men and, and ministering to the people, one of those gifts is not <laughs> the ability to see the heart, to truly see exactly where you are. And so it is a, an act of faith to believe that as you preach the Word, as you minister the Word, God will deal with those hidden parts of the being, that the Word of God will take root, that the Word will, will have an impact, because I don't want to be called to the, to the outcome of months of a heart becoming more hard and then that revealing itself in some awful sin or some departure from God that becomes very visible and everyone knows about it. This is why the ministry of the Word is so essential and that you come to God to hear from God every Lord's Day. That you're not creating a barrier in your heart where you don't want to hear the Word because that's disastrous. If there is not a word in season for you, Lord's Day by Lord's Day, there will be an indifference that will be developed in your heart, a hardness, a wall that is created that will allow you to drift further and further so that by and by, weeks, months pass, perhaps years, but eventually, eventually, it becomes very clear that you're far from God. It begins in the heart. It will not be when that happens, when that is revealed, we say, oh, it just, it just came upon that person all of a sudden. No, it didn't. It always begins in the heart, which is why looking to the inward man, looking into the soul, considering where you are before God in the inner being, not how you're fooling everyone, not how everyone is persuaded that you're a good, upstanding Christian, but what does God see? What does God behold? God forbid that in this church we are content merely to have everyone prim and proper and have all the external. And yet inwardly there has not been a real work of the Spirit. David has been brought to a point where he wants this inner work to be done renovation to occur. As we consider this renewing of a spirit, 
Note firstly, this renewal is an act of creation. This renewal is an act of creation. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Create in me a clean heart. Does David require the sovereign, almighty power of the Creator to come to his aid at this point in his life? Yes. Nothing less will do. This word is exactly what we perceive in the English, in the original. It is the idea of creating out of nothing, or at the very least, sometimes renewal or like renovation. But often it relates to creation out of nothing. It needs a sovereign act of power. So, as I was thinking about this, here's David praying, again, turning his heart, turning his mind inwardly, thinking about his heart and his spirit, and he says, create in me a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart. He is calling upon the Son of God to exercise his creative power in his being. You think of Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, as the Apostle Paul speaks of our Lord Jesus Christ, that by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. So, he's, he's dealing with these lofty things that exist, visible and invisible, powers and principalities and so on, they're all created by Him. The thrones, the dominions, they're all created by Him. But also, clean hearts are created by Him. Clean hearts. It is Jesus Christ who is the great creator of a clean heart. And David is before God, crying out essentially for the Son of God who made the worlds to create in Him who flung the stars into space to create in him a clean heart. Of course, he's not speaking here merely about the physical organ. He's dealing with that which is the seat of our desires, our affections, the longings of soul and being. And his heart, his longings, his innermost being is not clean. It has been corrupted by his sin. And he needs the Lord of glory to create, to create a clean heart. Does not help underline the vanity of religion that removes the supernatural, of religion that is based upon your effort and what you can do. This, this is not Christianity. Christianity is supernatural. It requires work to be done that no man can do. And even for the born-again believer, for the one who is saved, as David's able to talk about the God of his salvation in verse 14, this is a man who knows God, but he has gotten away from God and he needs still the mighty sovereign hand of his God to create in him a clean heart. This is something that Nathan cannot do. No prophet can do. No priest can do. David, as much as he may be king of Israel, he cannot do it himself. He is utterly dependent upon the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, you think back to the beginning when the Son of God took the very dust of the earth and made man, and fashioned man. And as he fashioned man, he fashioned all the parts of man in his physical frame. And he, in the fashioning of man, fashioned him in such a way to have an inclination towards God, to have desires for God, to have righteous affections and emotions toward God without sin. And as we well know, Adam rebelled, corrupting his heart. 
And God then declares in Genesis 3 to Satan, to Eve, to Adam, the consequences of the fall, stating to Adam, For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. It's exactly what God has said. You will die. And part of that death is the physical death of the body. You're going to return to the dust. And although the Scriptures don't explicitly say, I believe that right at that point, I think it's Genesis 3, 19 and 20, there in that part, right there, Adam needed to experience the same thing every sinner needs to experience, the new birth. His perfect heart had become corrupted by sin, and immediately, at that point, he needed a new heart. Now, we don't have any reference of Adam crying out, Create in me a clean heart, O God. We don't have him crying out for salvation, but we have, I believe, enough indication that right there at that point, God does a sovereign work of salvation in Adam's heart, because the very next words in Genesis 3, verse 20, and Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Now think of it. God has just declared, the day you eat of this, you will die. They've gone on and rebelled. And now God has said, dust thou art, unto dust thou shalt return. You're, you, you're going to experience exactly what I said. But instead of meditating on the, the thought of death, Adam's mind goes to the thought of life and calls his wife Eve because she's the mother of all living. Why would he do that? Except that there had been a work done in his heart, a hope created in his soul, that in spite of this fallen condition that he was now in, and that all his posterity would enter into, yet God had given a promise that the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent, and faith took hold of the promise. And a work of regeneration was done in the heart of this man, and he was given a new heart. Think of it. Christ creating, the Son of God creating in Adam a new heart, right there at that point. And this is something that he has been doing since that time, giving new hearts, creating new hearts. And this is what everyone needs. This is what our children need, beloved. This is what our children need. They don't need merely to memorize Scripture, memorize the catechism, and, and go through all the various things that we instruct them in. They need all of that in terms like it's important and there's value. But what they need ultimately, what they require, the foundation that is necessary beyond every other thing is a, a new heart. A new heart. As I've said, even in the recent days, there's nothing that we can do to do this. This causes us to cast ourselves upon God and say, Lord, you're going to have to do this work. I can't do it. David had been given a new heart many years ago. He had been saved. But now his prayer goes back to the need of a soul creating me a clean heart. He is not in this language saying, I need to be saved all over again. But he is meditating on the need for God to do a work in him that only God can do. His heart had permitted him, had encouraged him, had caused him to move away from his God and to put himself in the position that he found himself in. And now he's crying to God to do a transforming work in his life so that he would not do it again. I found it interesting as I was studying for this week. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 7, when you have the context of the flood, and the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. And you have the pulling together of two words there, I will destroy man whom I have created. These verbs... And those same verbs are found right here in verse 9 and 10. The word blot is the word destroy. And of course, you have the word create, whom man that God created. I thought about that. I thought, 
here's what God, as he looked upon the earth, I will destroy, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the earth. And here David is before God, essentially, he deserves to be blotted out. He deserves to be wiped out, to be destroyed from the face of the earth for his sin. No one would question that. But instead of him being blotted out, he has pleaded that God would blot out his sin, blot out, destroy that which would condemn me. Blot that out. Deal with that, O God. And as you created all men, create in me a clean heart. A clean heart. First use of the word clean is found back in reference to the animals that Noah brought into the ark. The clean animals to be brought in. That mean that they were animals that were more clean in terms of uh, lack of disease and so on. Well, there's different ways of looking at it in terms of animals and the habits of animals. But really, it, it, it's, it, it, some push this too far and they, when they analyze the animals. And usually there's contradictions to the uh, conclusions that they come to about, well, God chose these animals and that animal because it eats this and doesn't eat that and so on and so forth. But really what it comes down to is that God said, God declared, God pronounced certain animals to be ceremonially clean. They're clean. They're declared clean, not simply because they are less uh, diseased than other animals, but because God himself had declared them clean. God determines them clean. And because they're determined to be clean, think of it, because God has determined them to be clean, they can be offered to God. These are the animals that can be offered to God. The other animals cannot. They have been determined clean. And therefore, when David is praying, create in me a clean heart, he is wanting a heart that is declared before God clean. It's pronounced clean. God has said, this is clean, like he said, this animal's clean and that one's not. He wants God to say, your heart is clean. And he wants God to be able to say that so that he can then offer his heart to God. Why else would he want a clean heart? Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Why would he want that? What is the motivation to have a clean heart? Is it merely for respectability among men? Why does he want a clean heart? Why does he want a heart that can be determined by Almighty God to be clean? And I suggest to you, beloved, the primary motivation of David's heart is I want it to be declared clean by God so that I can in turn offer it to God and be accepted. This is what God asks for, isn't it? My son, give me thy heart. Give me your innermost being. I don't want the scraps of your life. I don't want lip service on a Sunday. I want you and I want all of you. I want the innermost part of your being there on the altar, as it were, sacrificed like those animals that were pronounced to be clean before God and acceptable in offerings before God. I want your heart to be the same. I want you, young person. I want you, older person. I want you, regardless of your past, I want you to present your heart to me, your life to me. I don't want part of it. I want it all. I want you. doesn't matter about what you've done. This is David's understanding. He knows, I want my heart to be clean. I want it to be seen, recognized by God as clean so I can turn, give it to him and not be in doubt whether or not God will accept it. This is about his recovery, getting back to where he was, going on with God, using his life, being a witness to the world. This is about progress. This is about continuing to be an instrument in the hand of God. Part of that requires a clean heart, a heart I can offer to God. Beloved, this is a need for every one of us. God to create in you and me a clean heart. I love the, as he inserts there, oh God, it gets to the, the cry of the heart, isn't it? Adding that, he didn't have to add that in. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me, that, this sense would be the same. But as I've said to you before, Psalm 51 is, is, is a man being honest before God is the, is the full spectrum of his heart on display. He feels, 
He's moved with emotion. He's lamenting. He's sobbing. He's crying. He feels this deeply. Create in me a clean heart, O God. He's not just saying words. He feels. He desires. He longs. And let me say this morning, if you feel, if you desire, you long for renewal, recovery before God, to serve God, to be used by God, to be a witness in your neighborhood, and be effectual in your witness, you present yourself the way David does. Forget about everyone else. Forget about the lukewarmness of the church at large. Don't consider that. You put your life before God. Create in me, O oh God, a clean heart. Do this work in me. This is so important, especially... I was going to say especially for young people. It's for everyone. But there's a sense in which young people need to learn early. They need to learn early what it is to be all on the altar. That's the language here. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. I want my inner being to be clean, cleansed, acceptable, because the purpose, the privilege, the priority of his mind is to give this back to God. It's not selfish. So, you've seen this renewal is an act of creation. This renewal must be paired with constancy. It must be paired with constancy. He goes on to say, renew a right spirit within me. Renew. Similar to create, but more bringing it to a state that I have known before, more clearly gives that sense of recovery, renovation. The Spirit refers to the inner being, the, the attitude of David. A new right spirit within me. But when he uses the word right, you may have a margin that shows you this. And it says, or constant, you can put in constant. When you, a constant spirit within me. And that is a sense. I want to be constant. Or as more commonly, perhaps, the idea is in Scripture, steadfastness. I want to be steadfast. The steadfastness is one of those attributes of men that... <laughs> Greatly overlooked. Greatly overlooked. There are certain stages of life where you, be, you begin to realize the value of steadfastness, <laughs> of, of stability, of constancy. And so if you start your own business, you start employing people, you learn very quickly the value of constancy. He turns up every day. Just to turn up is a wonderful thing. At the time that is specified, they're there. It's great. <laughs> because you learn that not everyone has this constant steadfastness. And it's a, it's, it's a constant being of the being of the, someone who tried to employ people. It's over and over again. Like, how many opportunities do you give them before you go and look for someone else and hope that they're more constant? It's, no doubt teachers see it. And as you get older, generally various experiences of life show you the value of being constant. Now, again, it's, it's not glamorous. It's really not. Everyone wants to have other attributes. They want to have, you know, gifts that are sparkly and, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. They, something that's on display that gets praise. And generally, this, this is not valued by men at large. Men aren't really, they don't attain fame for being constant. They have to have something else. And someone may say that they're so, I can th you think of sports, and I'm, I, I can't talk in terms of American football or basketball, but I could talk in terms of soccer. And I look back and I think of soccer players that they, they, they were not the guys who get the big contracts. They were not the ones who had dazzling displays that, that everyone talked about. They weren't the ones who won the awards at the end of the year. And yet, 
if you were inside the dressing room or as they talk about it, these players retire and they talk about various teammates and those that they played with and they refer back to this person, they say, this person never received much recognition, never received the attention that he deserved, but he was always steady. He was a 7, 8 out of 10 every single game. Every game. Never put in a poor performance. Was always working hard, always doing his job. It may not have been attractive, it may not have been pretty, but he was there every week. First name on the team sheet because you can depend on him. But he doesn't get the big contracts, but you can depend on him. And the insiders know the value of that turning up every game. And being consistent. They don't get the big contracts. They don't get the big sponsorships. But they are consistent. Well, God values this. And David knows it. He wants a constant spirit. Renew a constant spirit within him. This is the life of faith. It is consistency. It is walking, looking to Jesus day by day. Speaking of the righteous, Psalm 112, verse 7, his heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. Fixed. There's a constancy there. This is what the righteous do. They, they can be depended upon. But it's more than just keeping on the right way. It has a sense of being rooted and stable, immovable. And this is a wonderful trait, to be immovable in the right way. This is maybe more relevant to young people today. And not just today, it has always been particularly pertinent to those in youth. Youth brings with it a certain spirit, a certain frame of mind, a, a sense of hope and uh, idealism. And it's, God uses it. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. It's, it's not bad, but, but it can be played upon. And what we see today, not new, but certainly it is very much <laughs> on display in our day, is the devil working constantly to cause young people to drift. I'm not talking about outside the church. I'm talking about inside the church. I'm talking about the temptation to drift. Parents, you need to wake up. The forces at work on your children when they come to an age of autonomy, when they begin to think for themselves, 14, 15, 16 and on, up to about close to 30, when they are, in that place, they are so vulnerable, so vulnerable to drifting from biblical values. They don't want to stay the course because the devil's constantly pushing them to experiment with new ideas. The devil wants you, young person, to support the quote-unquote gay Christian. He wants you to think that transgenderism is normal. He wants you to believe that conformity to your parents' values is a form of oppression. He wants you to think that every civilization was innocent and has been oppressed by Christianity. And you're going to be part of a movement that will acknowledge this and, and turn your back on it all. And ultimately, he wants you to question Scripture in the background of every young person's life, though they're not aware of it, and though parents at times don't discern it either, in the background of their life with all the movement and all the changes that are happening at breakneck speed in our day, at the background there's this voice that is leading them into these temptations, half God said has he really said this is what God wills in terms of marriage and relationship? Has he really said that these issues, other related issues, are wrong? Has he really said it? And so you come to Scripture, and really you're not looking to find out what Scripture says. You're trying to interpret Scripture in a new way that the church has never recognized. 
You're trying because, and especially for young women, especially for young women, because young women tend to be, I'm speaking in generalities, they tend to be nurturers, which makes them more compassionate and more agreeable. And so all it takes is for a young woman to have a friend who comes out, who says, this is who I am, and they feel this, they're torn because even in their youth, even in their teenage years, there is that agreeableness and compassion that doesn't want to say it's wrong. And that is why in a lot of the movements today they are being led by women. Because these people that they think they're being oppressed and they're trying to protect them, they're trying to mother them. That's what's going on. They cannot look people in the eye and say, this is wrong. And it's coming into the church. It's, it's in the church. It's here. David had drifted. His heart had drifted. He had spent months away from God. And as he comes to God, he doesn't want just to be forgiven in a once-for-all experience, he doesn't want to just, okay, my sins are gone, and I've, I'm recovered now. He wants, he wants constancy, because without the constancy, he'll go right back to what he did before. He'll convince himself that it's okay to take another man's wife, and it's okay to hide the sin by putting this man to death. That's okay. He has drifted in the background of his Mind was Satan saying, hath God said? Oh, David, you're a king now. You can do what you like. The rules change when you become king. Don't be limited by the old ways. Constancy. Young person, if you pray anything, pray that you will be kept constant. Hebrews 3.14, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. We're made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Placed into Christ in the years of youth, you must hold fast to the end. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, Watch ye stand fast in the faith. Oh, drifting is not you. Wasn't you in David's day? Wasn't you in the apostles' day? Believers drifted. Professing believers drifted. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. He counted the cost. He looked, do I want to be hated by the world and put to death? Or do I want to stay alive, being accepted by the world? I'll take the latter. He chose. He fell away. There are always forces seeking to destabilize. So Jesus says to Simon, Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, see it, Simon. Oh, won't you see it? Behold, Satan hath desired to have you. And he may sift you as wheat desires to have you. Oh, young person, see it. He desires to have you. He desires to have you. He does. He desires it. <laughs> Looking at you, young people, he desires it. He wants you. You're in the crosshairs. You are a target. All the forces that militate what you're taught from the Scriptures are designed to move you away. He hates Christ he hates how you're honoring him right now. He hates how you like his will above Satan's will. He doesn't like that. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy you in a way that perhaps it will be irreparable. That you'll never go on with God. Never live for God. Won't marry a Christian. Won't raise children in 
the Christian faith, to understand the gospel. Now you'll go your own way, marry an unbeliever, raise children as heathens, who will become the problem of the next generation. He desires to have you because he has the long term in view. He does. It's not so short sighted as you are, or I may be. He's thinking long term. So I know you preach these things and you're considered old fashioned. And so we have a whole generation now that doesn't like this kind of thing. And young people don't like it because it makes them uncomfortable. Because there's such pressure through social media and everything that's out there to try and get them to conform. And then when you come to church and the Word of God is open before you, you don't want to feel that torment. You'd rather go somewhere where either they don't deal with these issues or they actually argue the case for how it's fine to change from the old ways. Listen, I'm not out to make your life a misery. The exact opposite is true. I'm trying to head you in. I'm trying to get you to understand what David learned too late, what he prayed too late, when he felt his heart drifting, when he's, his eyes locked onto Bathsheba and desires began to arise within his heart, he should have been crying out, Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Give me that constancy that I once had. But he wasn't praying that way. David understands that there's little point in a new heart if there's no constancy to keep it in that state. This is why faithfulness, steadfastness is so important. Turn for a moment to Hebrews 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Because in Hebrews 10, the apostle dealing with the blessings of the new covenant touches on the full experience of it, what it does for us. So, there's been the passing away of the old. There's no longer the sacrificing. There's no longer the priest. We can, we'll take time to read from verse 10. From verse 1 would be helpful, but we'll limit ourselves to verse 10. Hebrews 10, verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Sanctified. This is this is the change that goes on. We are being changed because of the sacrifice of Christ once for all. Verse 11, And every priest standeth daily ministering and often, offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. For all of the Holy Ghost also is witness to us. For after that he had said before, so he's going back quoting scripture, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now I want you to look there at verse 16 and 17. This is the covenant promise that is, was known to some degree. I mean, these experiences weren't completely alien to those before in the Old Testament era, but they become more full in light of the death of Christ and His resurrection. And look what it's promising. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. This is, I am putting the means that is necessary to make them constant. I don't want them wavering. I want them to be constant. And I'm going to put my word in their hearts to such a degree that they will be constant as well as the blessing of the forgiveness of their sins. So you see Hebrews 10, verses 16 and 17, correlate with the two verses we've been dealing with this week and last week in Psalm 51. Last week dealing with forgiveness. Blot out my transgressions, blot out my iniquities. He's crying out for the forgiveness of sins. That's verse 17. Now, as we come to verse 10, he's looking for constancy, the ability to continue on, faithful before God. That is a promise that is given to you, Christian, this morning. God will keep you constant. That's his will and desire for you, not just to justify, but to sanctify. Not just to deal with the problem of sin, but the progression of holiness. This is what we have in Christ. This is what is ours. 
Now, the question is, are you in need of a clean heart? Are you in need of a constant spirit, a renewed constant spirit? Maybe it's faithfulness that really is the, the thing to consider most of all here this morning. Just to be faithful. The value of being faithful. Constant. You're there. You're walking with God. You don't have gifts that are spectacular and renowned. You're not going to be talked about in the ages to come. You're ordinary. But hey, ordinary is okay. Ordinary when it honors God, it's a wonderful, wonderful trait that will have its reward in due course. F.B. Meyer said, perhaps a steadfast spirit is our chief need, especially so as we gird up our loins for a new stretch of pilgrimage. We do not need nobler ideals. A young person entering into a new stretch of pilgrimage, going into university, going into employment. What do you need? More than anything, what do you need? To be constant, to be steadfast. You do not need a nobler ideal. May the Lord help us to realize that. Let's bow together in prayer. very easy in this moment to zone out and wait for the meeting to close. But these are important moments where you can pray over what you've heard. As you sit there in the pew thinking about how God has applied his word to you, let it marinate. Let it sink in. Let it take root. Our God, I pray that thou wilt help us all to be constant. We care not for the approval of the world. And should there be any care, God, help us to crucify it. We pray that thou wilt create in us clean hearts that we can offer to thee in full. That lay our lives upon the altar to honor our Savior, to live for his glory. Bless us then. Be with us, especially our young people. God, our hearts, our hearts break for them. We never want to hear the news that they have departed from the faith. So God, we pray. We plead with thee that our young people will be kept by the power of God. We plead with thee that they would be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Give them a sense of the eternal value of serving Christ. Make them compassionate in the right way. Understanding of the trials of men and women, lost people, in the right way. But don't let them compromise. So Lord, we pray. Take our children into thy hands and use them for thy glory. And may they, may they be mighty. Yes, make them constant first and foremost, but if it, pleaseth, if it would please thee, Lord, make some of them even mighty. 
preachers of the word, missionaries of the cross, whatever field of service you would have for them, God bless them. Hear our prayers this day. Sanctify our afternoon hours and bring us back here tonight to enjoy more of thy presence in thy house with thy people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.